So this case was uh, of a young lady who, who was myopic her whole life and saw well with her glasses just until the last couple of years. She had been recently working as an accountant and she was just noticing her vision was getting more blurry over the past two years. She also complained of, of the various um, complaints depending on the lighting. So especially when she was driving, when there's bright lights coming on, she felt like her vision was worse. She can read better on a dark, like the night background instead of black letters on a white background. And she had some different changes with her vision at night. At night, she felt like she could see green lights and, and during the day she could not. So, um, and in this scenario, the patient has no knowledge of her family history because she was adopted as a child. And so her visual acuity was 2160 in both of her eyes and her intraocular pressure was within normal limits. <clears throat> So oh, it's not working. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right, the right eye color from this photo. Um, overall media looked clear, nerve, um, was pink sharp flat, small you know, cut discs. Look at the vessels, uh, pretty normal uh, caliber, virtuosity. Um, her papillary is seeing some like white spots, uh, kind of um, multifocal, but those could be, I guess that could be an artifact there. Um, Attention is drawn to the macula, where we have those are all reflections. Yeah, those are reflections. Uh, the macula, we have um, kind of like hypopigmented parafobial um, pattern, um, and fovea itself, like it's pigmented. Almost like there. Um, and I see uh, in the periphery, it looks like there's a little. Brain hemorrhage there or something? Uh, like a white center hemorrhage. Like a rock spot. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, <laughs> just seeing if there's any emboli in the vessels. No, it's just all in this shining artifact here. Um, although, basically, there's also a little white uh, area of one of the, um, the vessel bifurcations, potentially artifact as well. Yeah, I think that's it. That's well, it's also kind of like a uh, speckled, exudative. Um, how to write in that in the phobia, right? yeah, central macula. Um, so it's the left eye, colored from this photo. So overall, um, pretty similar appearance, actually. So you get the normal nerve vessels. Um, and then the macula has, again, this kind of hypopigmented uh, speckled pattern with um, some whitish yellow spots. Um, you're seeing more, I think, just artifact again with the, the white lesions of the macula and you know, around the nerve. Um, otherwise, uh, periphery looks here unremarkable to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have uh, autofluorescence, and we're seeing um, a pattern of hyperautofluorescence, parafobially, more, uh, again, sort of like speckled hypofluorescent. Spots uh, as we get more potentially in the phobia. Um, otherwise, pretty standard looking vas vasculature and nerve there. Mm -hmm. The other eye? Uh, very similar pattern, potentially uh, more hypo autofluorescent uh, in phobia and parafobial kind of rim. Interesting mm -hmm. rim there, hyper autofluorescence. <clears throat> and here's OCT. Okay, here's the OCT. Um, normal phobial contour, uh, but attention is drawn to the, the outer retinal atrophy here um, with the uh, yeah, grossly abnormal outer retina, retina of the uh, subphobial region. Um, extending out laterally, the retina looks more. You know, sure, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. uh, extending laterally, the retina looks more normal. Um, and the choroid is about the same thickness of the retina, so not, not too remarkable there. It's kind of thick. A little thick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little thicker. Okay. Probably mm -hmm. 500. It's not so. It's supposed to be as thick as the center of the retina. Although oh, this one's oh. thin, but it shouldn't be as thick as the point of the edges. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Other eye, left eye. Similarly, subphobially, we see some outer retinal loss and atrophy here um, with that shine through. 
and there's maybe a little bit of either pigment migration or um, or just um, like just hyper reflective uh, spots uh, paraphobially. See, uh, ELM looks maybe somewhat discontinuous here. Um, and, yeah, otherwise, the retina looks more normal as we extend away from the away, away from the fovea. And those are called hypertransmission. Don't think the bright things. And those are actually the most reproducible marker of RP atrophy. So as we get more and more, not that this is macro generation geographic atrophy, but as we get more and more into doing more geographic atrophy as there's treatments, people are those hypertransmission things are are, are going to be more referenced in clinical studies on follow up. Um here with another cut. Uh, the uh, left eye, um, lower, much lower quality image. Um, this is the, vert the vertical cut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The horizontal. The um, uh, Decent foveal contour, um, but seeing again the outer retinal loss here. Um, otherwise, the image quality is not great, but kind of seeing similar, maybe ELM, just uh, this irregularity. Um, and then, yeah, that's in uh, some foveal change here. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Back <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, as, as Matt pointed out, what just notes that I made on the color fundus photo that there are small, like yellow white portions in the fovea, and there is some modeling of the RP. There's some darker patches and lighter patches, and the rest of the retina looked fine. The on the fundus autofluorescence, the the flecks that were seen on the color fundus photos were hyper autofluorescent. And then centrally, there's hypo autofluorescence, and they're surrounded by a ring of the hyper autofluorescent ring of the, the macula. And then, as we saw in the OCT, it's mostly the outer retina that has this focal thinning disruption. So let's go on to the differential diagnosis. Hmm. And that hemorrhage was just kind of a finding. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just okay. forget about that. Yeah. Um, well, the history and exam um, concern for your macular dystrophy, uh, dystrophy such as. Um, uh, you know, like code dystrophy, star guard dystrophy. Um, <clears throat> we have, uh, yeah, so bilateral, she's 20, 25 years old. Um, uh, like a pattern dystrophy. Um, Who's that laser pointer case, man? Kevin did. Uh, <laughs> the laser right now, case. Um, yeah, and um, if it leaves some general amorosis, I guess we'll for that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the main ones. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, meds. Okay, meds. Okay. I got some mm -hmm. I just wrote down some that could be associated with oh, like that's yellow that's spots in the macula mm -hmm. and also bilateral visual loss. So and yellow, she's really young, as we said. And there's also like although best vitelliform macular dystrophy is the vitelliform lesion, sometimes it can be confused for these like yellow lesions in the macula, as well as central areolar or choreal oh, dystrophy, sure. cone rod dystrophy, as we said, and uh, retinitis pigmentosa is more of a peripheral lesion, but just something that should be considered someone who's young who develops bilateral vision loss. So, oh, I have one, one more, one more slide for you. <laughs> and I, I want to know if this changes your interpretation, <laughs> but most likely that. Potentially positive in the variant ABC A4, right, that's the gene Associated with Stargard. I think some other dystrophies do, but the main one is Stargard's. It was actually just a really good paper, which may be worth it. It was 264, maybe two, I remember, maybe 264, but it was hundreds of cases with uh, ABCA4 and how, how in all the different um, um, phenotypes. And it was it was interesting. It was a fair amount of variety. Mm. Okay, so in this case, the patient has Stargard disease. Oh, that's Carl Stargard. That's <laughs> I wish his name was, I always misspell it. I like, never knew that. <laughs> so they're off topic, but oh, yeah, yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only way I remember the eponymous name, but I just like pull up a picture of the guy in my little flashcard. Do you know when he was, when he was? That was 1909 was when he originally described the first case. <laughs> you can tell it. I can tell he's probably a good guy. All the people, all the bad guys that got their name taken off, like Ryder Syndrome and, and uh, Wagner's brain Yeah, what year did you say? 19? Yeah, 19.
Oh, nice. Yeah, a little too early. Yeah. Probably was a good guy. Thirty. Yeah. Yeah. But um, so star growth disease is the most common inherited macular dystrophy. What was interesting to me reviewing this case was that it's related to a genetic defect in the ABCA4 gene, which encodes an ATP binding cassette, which is expressed in the RPE, which results in the accumulation of lipofuscin, lipofuscin. Some, some references say a lipofuscin-like material, mm -hmm. which is primarily composed of A2E in the RPE. And that extends, you know, presumably to the entire red, right. as you can see in the dark cord. But, and I was looking at why should it be that just in the macula, as we said, as we saw in the OCD, that we should have all the shine through in the RP atrophy. And it seems that because of the dense the collection of all the photoreceptors in the macula, um, it is more active metabolically and the cones themselves are more metabolically active than the rods. And so that could be contributing to why in the early disease, you'll have just in the macula. And then as it progresses, you can find it in the periphery, you can find it in the Well, that's interesting. I never thought about that, how it expresses everywhere. That was true of most genetic, but yeah, why it expresses everywhere but manifests in one spot? It's mm -hmm. a good question. Mm -hmm. So, but... Um, I so, heard it's a very big gene. So for genetic, we never talk about, oh, that's a big gene. But for genetic therapy, um, it's a hard one to get in because people are having trouble trying to figure out how to get it in because it's just such a big gene. And then as we saw in this case, patients have a gradual decline in their central visual acuity. Some may describe a central scotoma and uh, photophobia as well and difficulty seeing in bright and dim lighting as well. So, and here, here we didn't in this case do a fluorescent geography. It seems, although this is the like the picture that everyone thinks of with Stargard disease, it's not necessarily sensitive or well, it's relatively sensitive. Eighty percent of people with Stargard disease should have the dark cord sign, but it's not very specific. As I think it's sixty, it is is not that specific for necessarily Stargard disease, but. Um, on um, yeah, the typical exam findings, as we saw, were the yellow-white flecks. Those are called the pisciform flecks, fish-shaped. I, I was trying to figure out what, what they meant by fish-shaped. That, <laughs> that, that threw me for, It took me a long time to figure that out. <laughs> and um, the, the atrophic, pale inner part of the phobia is surrounded by more mottled dark areas on the macula, and that is correlated with on the fundus autofluorescence. There is the hypo autofluorescent central macula, which is supposed to be the atrophic macula, surrounded by the hyperautofluorescent flex, which are causing stress on the surrounding dying macula. And that causes the hyper autofluorescent ring on the macula that we saw in the fundus autofluorescence. And so that is sometimes called, there's, some, there's like a bullseye, sometimes it's called a bullseye sign. And that mottled kind of brownish, orangish appearance of the macula is sometimes described as beaten bronze. So it didn't look that beaten bronze in our pictures. Maybe that's a more advanced, yeah. you know, appearance of the macula. The, and again, like this patient had no flex. Yeah, you know, so they are all kind of a little different in mm -hmm. the CA4s. And unfortunately for the management, there is some limited evidence that in people who have high amounts of vitamin A will have poor outcomes because vitamin A is the precursor to the lipofuscin-like material. So some societies for Stargard disease recommend not supplementing vitamin A or not ingesting a high amount of vitamin A, and of course not cutting out vitamin A. So <laughs> only one. Only one. Only one. I think there's a treatment trial for a vitamin A chelating drug. Oh, that I haven't so seen. I think people, I remember uh, you know, Christine, one of your former residents, was, does, she's up in Gainesville. She does some, is interested in a star guard song. I think she was a study center. So I think vitamin A is bad enough that they were actually looking at chelating. So I think vitamin A is bad for star guard speaking. And then family members should be have genetic counseling because the, the disease is autosomal recessive. So it seems like she had two pathologic variants, unfortunately. Her mother had, her mother had, Star heart disease, and her father had retinitis pigmentosa. Yes, so a little weird. Very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, that's not common. But but the other thing for star, I think it's a fairly common gene defect, though. I, I he sounds like you read a lot of it. I, I think I saw somewhere seven percent of the population carrying it. Oh, it's like a 
fairly common carrier state. Mm -hmm. I don't say shall it be 27 or something else, but one of, one of the bank ABCA4 is, is a pretty common mutation. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's all I have on this. Oh, that's the 